Good day. It's so good to be here with you, and, and thank you for the hundredth time, maybe, for welcoming me in your places. It's so good to be here with you and, and to bring a message from, from God's Word today, and I pray that you will be blessed and that you will grow in your, the knowledge of Jesus Christ and the grace of Jesus Christ. So why don't we begin? Pastor Matt McCullough of Nashville, Tennessee, recently asked a question that is worth repeating today. Uh, quote, I wonder how we will remember the last couple of years. That's a good question, isn't it? Uh, all of us have our own stories and experiences of the pandemic. Stories of how we've been impacted and the lasting and continuing effect in our lives today. But Master, Pastor, Master, pardon me, Pastor Matt challenges us with another question that bears asking as well. Quote, how will we cope with, with the disorientation of the last couple, month, couple years? To say that the last 30 or so months has been disorienting seems to me an understatement. You see, all the insurances we had pre-pandemic, the processes, pretty much all that we considered secure and took for granted disappeared like a rabbit in a magician's hat. It went poof. So we're left today to, we are left today to wonder where we will look for stability in the days ahead. Please turn in your Bibles to Ecclesiastes chapter 5, verse 1 through 7. And we'll read that together. Ecclesiastes chapter 5, verse 1 through 7. Verse 1, Guard your steps when you go to the house of God. To draw near, to listen, is better than to offer the sacrifice of fools. For they do not know that they are doing evil. Be not rash with your mouth, nor let your heart be hasty to utter a word before God. For God is in heaven, and you are on earth. Therefore let your words be few. For a dream comes with much business, and a fool's voice with many words. Verse 4. When you vow a vow to God, do not delay paying it, for he has no pleasure in fools. Pay what you vow. It is better that you should not vow than that you should vow and not pay. Let not your mouth lead you into sin, and do not say before the messenger that it was a mistake. Why should God be angry at your voice and destroy the work of your hands? For when dreams increase and words grow many, there is vanity. But God is the one you must fear. The Lord bless the reading of his word. Let us pray. Almighty God, we thank you for this day. Thank you for bringing us together in this format. And I pray for my brothers and sisters and all who are listening that God, by your Holy Spirit, uh, you, would all, you would help us to understand uh, your message for us today, to, to, to let the Holy Spirit really push it deep into our hearts and, and give us the knowledge and understanding that we need uh, to move forward from here. We just thank you so much for your presence in our lives, Lord. And we give you thanks in Jesus' name. Amen. Ecclesiastes begins with this introduction with the very first word, ver, verse in chapter 1. The words of the preacher, the son of David, king in Jerusalem. And then it's followed by, this introduction is followed by a poem. A poem that when thought through carefully, can best be described as disorienting. Matter of fact, the whole book can be viewed as disorienting, perplexing. Ecclesiastes itself is included in the books of the Bible classified as wisdom literature. And because it is the inspired word of God, it's put here in the Bible, and it is wisdom from God above, we would be wise to try and understand what Ecclesiastes is teaching us about our time what is teaching us about humanity. Now chapter 1, verse 2 to 3, the preacher said this, or writes this, Vanity of vanities, says the preacher. Vanity of vanities. All is vanity. What does man gain by all the toil at which he toils under the sun? Then from verse 4 on, the preacher describes what he meant by under the sun. Why don't we just cut to the chase? Under the sun is another way to describe all of life, another way to describe day in and day out living in the world. For example, the preacher said this, A generation goes and a generation comes, but the earth remains forever. 
That's verse 4. Then the sun rises and the sun goes down. Verse 5. The wind blows to the south and goes around to the north. Verse 6. And all the streams run to the sea, but the sea is not full. Verse 7. This is life under the sun. Then the preacher gives his assessment of life under the sun. We see this in verse 8. The preacher said, All things are full of wearying. All things are full of weariness, and man cannot utter it. The eye is not satisfied without seeing. This phrase, under the sun, is found over 30 times in Ecclesiastes. And over 30 times it describes everyday life and everyday pursuits. Yet I, I would suggest to you that it describes more than everyday Monday to Sunday living and working than retirement as we think in our context. You see, the author of Ecclesiastes, the preacher, had everything in life. He literally had it all. There was no one to tell him, no, you can't have it. And he had it all in spades. We see this in chapter 2 and describes it very clearly for us. For the preacher tried it all. Pleasure, comedy, fine wine, entertainment, sex, work, money, possessions. And folks, before we shake our righteous heads and lift our sanctified nose in the air, listen to what the preacher said about his pursuits. We find this in chapter 2, verse 9, 10, where he said, So I became great and surpassed all who were before me in Jerusalem. And also my wisdom remained with me. And whatever my eyes desired, I did not keep from them. I kept my heart from no pleasure, for my heart found pleasure in all my toil. And this was my reward for all my toil. You see, his heart found pleasure in his toil. Are we not like the preacher? Let's admit it. Our hearts can find pleasure in our pursuits, whatever they may be. Let's be honest about that. And maybe you're wondering then, Pastor, and you might ask this question. You might not, but I'm going to ask it. I'm going to ask myself this question. Does that mean my life is a waste of time? Well, answer, no. The preacher asked the same question of his life. He said it this way, what gain has the worker from his toil? And he answers his own question. I have seen the business that God has given to the children of man to be busy with. He has made everything beautiful in his time. Also, he has put eternity in man's heart, yet so that he cannot find out what God has done from the beginning to the end. I perceive that there is nothing better for them than to be joyful and to do good as long as they live. Also that everyone should eat and drink and take pleasure in all his toil. This is God's gift to man. Ask me your question again, or let me ask this question again. Is my life a waste of time? Answer, yes. What do you mean, pastor? Well... The preacher asked the same question. I applied my heart to seek and to search out by wisdom all that is done under, under heaven. And what was his conclusion? Here it is. You'll find in chapter 2, verse 13 to 15. It is an unhappy business that God has given to the children of man to be busy with. I have seen everything that is done under the sun. I have seen everything that is done under the sun. Pardon me, I said that twice. And behold, all is vanity in a striving after the wind. What is crooked cannot be made straight, and what is lacking cannot be counted. Please notice with me the word vanity. It can also be translated meaningless, like in the NIV translation. And this word vanity or meaningless is also found over 30 times in Ecclesiastes. And it means vapor, mist, or mere breath. Describing that something that is here one moment, then poof. I'm going to like the word poof during the sermon. But anyways, poof, it's gone. Well, I think at this time, uh, many of us are quite disoriented. And you may be wondering about your life. Is it a gift from God? Or is it all vanity? Is it all meaningless? Well, let's go back to the introduction, the questions that were asked of us about our experiences during the last few years. Remember how everything we trusted went poof. The things that brought joy in our life went poof. Like a breath, like a mere breath, like a vapor. Now it appears that we have turned the corner and we are left with this question. How do we gain our footing again? How do we do that? Do we return to the vanities that we put our trust 
and assurances in prior to the pandemic? Have we not learned that human self-sufficiency always fails somewhere along the line in time? Have we not learned that there's no such thing as normal? That as the preacher said, what has been is what will be, and what has been done is what will be done, and there's nothing new under the sun? Let me ask, do you see now why God put Ecclesiastes in the Bible? For here we have a man who had it all and more. He was the wisest, the smartest, the richest, the most popular, the most powerful king of all human history. He did it all. He tasted it all. He experienced it all. And there was no one to stop him. And at the end of it, he came to this one conclusion. That without God, that's key. Everything created by humanity, everything discovered by humanity, then, now, and tomorrow. Every good work, all of it is vanity. It doesn't amount, friends, to a hill of beans. It is indeed a vapor. Well, as we look around today, August 2022, as we draw near to the end of summer, it seems that the majority of people are back to seeking all those things that let them down so very hard in early 2020. Pleasure, comedy, fine wine, entertainment, sex, work, money, and possessions. It's not that we should enjoy life. The preacher has already said that humanity should be joyful and do good all their lives. This is God's gift to humanity. You see, it's not a question of work, enjoying things. It is a question of what we put our trust in, who we put our trust in. You see, Ecclesiastes challenges all our conceptions of what is trustworthy and worthy of our efforts. And today it challenges us to consider a truth which Pastor Matt puts so well here for us. Quote, nothing is certain about life under the sun except death. And let's be honest about this. This is a truth we all struggle to face and often choose to bury our heads in the sand and deal with it. Also, Ecclesiastes unnervingly paints a clear picture of our culture today. We know human secularism is on the rise. You know, secularism, which is in its political and philosophical view, rejects all forms of religious faith and worship. Indeed, Ecclesiastes is for the believer and the unbeliever a disorienting book indeed. Well, one of the pastors I appreciate greatly in my own spiritual formation is Pastor Alistair Begg. And in his examination of Ecclesiastes, he said that if it weren't for the pop-ups, this is what he calls these things, the pop-ups in the book, Ecclesiastes would be almost impossible to explain in the context of the Bible, let alone preach from. And Pastor Alistair said, it is the pop-ups that bring understanding to the reader. Here's one example of what he describes as a pop-up. Chapter 2, verse 24 and 25. The preacher said, There is nothing better for a person than he should eat and drink and find enjoyment in his toil. This also I saw is from the hand of God. For apart from him, who can eat, who can have enjoyment? Then we have another pop-up in chapter 3, verse 11. He, that is God, has made everything beautiful in his time. Also, he's put eternity into man's heart. Then we have one in 7, 14. The preacher said, in the day of prosperity, be joyful. In the day of adversity, consider God has made the one as well as the other, so that man may not find out anything that will be after him. Now, there are, there are other pop-ups, but the last one I want to present to you is the one that we read together in chapter 5, verse 1 to 7. And of course, we don't have time to work through these, each of these verses. Suffice it to let the preacher make his point here from verse 7 of our text. God is the one you must fear. God is the one you must fear. Well, friends, if Ecclesiastes points to a life that is meaningless outside of acknowledging God in all life, then Ecclesiastes most certainly points to the one and only God of all creation. While Ecclesiastes in many ways portrays a silent God, it is set in a Bible that reveals God has, that reveals that God has spoken to us from the very beginning of human history. And it's no stretch biblically to consider Ecclesiastes, Ecclesiastes 
if anything, reminds us that God has provided a way to be reconciled to him. That while God is to be feared, he is approachable. He is unlike all the other gods of the world. That God, from the very beginning of human history, desires to be in the midst of his people. To be in relationship with his people. That God has done everything that was needed to be done so that anyone, anywhere can have a relationship with him. Ecclesiastes, in so many ways, provides the motivation for evangelism. That life doesn't have to be meaningless. And this begs the question that I want to ask you, do you believe this? And the greater question, do Christians today believe this? For we do live in a time that not only is secularism growing in the West, but at the same time people who call themselves Christians are yielding to apostasy. In other words, people are deserting the Christian faith. Now, this is not a new thing. We see this in the New Testament. And Jude writes about that in his letter where he said, Beloved, although I was eager to write to you about our common salvation, I found it necessary to write appealing to you to contend for the faith that was once delivered to the saints. You see, there were some folks entering the church who were perverting the gospel, thus causing some to desert the faith once delivered to the saints. The Apostle Paul addressed this issue to Timothy in his first letter where Paul said, Now the Spirit expressly says that in later times some will depart from the faith by devoting themselves to deceitful spirits and teachings of demons. Now if you were to take a trip with me through the current evangelical landscape in North America, you would find many deserting the faith, faith once delivered to the saints, devoting themselves to deceitful spirits and teachings of demons. Remember the pop-up we had in our text today, that God is the one you must fear? This is where I would suggest to you where we go sideways, if we don't understand what it means to fear God. You see, the Israelites, the Old Testament, for the most part, even didn't get that. They didn't understand what it meant to fear God. We see this, you read about it in the Old Testament. And let's think about that. Of all the people, they should have understood this. They were there in person when God plagued Egypt. They lit, where God literally brought powerful Egypt down to its knees. They witnessed the cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night, the very presence of God protecting them and leading them. They watched when God parted the Red Sea, when he let his people pace, pass pardon me, safely through the Red Sea while Pharaoh's armies were swallowed up by the very same sea. He showed himself to his people by descending from heaven upon the mountain, Mount Sinai. Of course, there was fire and smoke and lightning. And yes, it seems they feared God then, but that did not last. Soon many departed because of unbelief. We hear the story of, we see the story in the Old Testament of the golden calf. The complaining and the complaining and the complaining about, slave, about better food when they were slaves. They, they refused also to take the land that God had promised them. There were some who feared God, but many didn't. Author Liz Wan, in her article, ponders why the majority of Israel's, Israelites did not fear God. And she asks a good question. What were, asked a good question or two. What were the Israelites missing? What did they not believe about God? Then Liz gives us an illustration from the Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. This is one of my favorite analogies uh, that I often use in some of my preaching. And there we find in one scene, Susan... Uh, where she finds out that Aslan is a lion, and she said this, quote, I shall feel rather nervous about meeting a lion. Of course, wouldn't you? Wouldn't I? Susan, Susan then asked Mr. Beaver if Aslan was safe. He replied, safe? Who said anything about safe? Of course he isn't safe, but he's good. He's the king. And here's Liz's point. Quote, the Israelites knew that God wasn't safe, but they didn't believe he was good. And I would submit that Liz's conclusion and observation is the same condition that many who call themselves Christians struggle with today. They may be acquainted with the concept that God is not safe, but don't believe he is good. So then they run after temporary relief, pleasure, comedy, fine wine, entertainment, sex, work, money, and possession. Well, friends, this brings us to these questions. 
Questions for you to ponder. And I hope you take the challenge and answer them. Do you believe that God is good? Really, do you believe this? Do you believe this over the last few years? Do you believe this today? You see, I think it's easy to do so when all things are well in our lives. Yet when a pandemic comes or something else, difficult, not so much. You see, folks, as Christians, we always need to be reminded all the time that Jesus Christ is always good, never safe. We need to remember that John's gospel proclaims a God who, is, who comes to his people today not on a mountaintop, but as God the Son. John writes, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory. Glory is the only Son of the Father, full of grace and truth. You see, friends, the gods of this world demand a high price from their followers, and they will get it. The writer to the Hebrews reminds us of God the Son, who is always good, never safe. Let us then, with confidence, draw near to the throne of grace, that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Friends, God is always good, but he's never safe. Ecclesiastes teaches us that life apart from God is vanity of vanities, a vapor, meaningless. And we are left with one question, where will one find stability in this world? And it's a question I want to leave you as I draw this to a conclusion. Where will you find stability in this world? Let's pray. Our Lord and God, we just thank you so much for your son Jesus. For we can enter the throne room. Yes, we come with trembling knees, but with the assurance of your goodness and your mercy. And we thank you for that, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, thank you so much. Shalom.